It's hard to kill a piano. My name is George Tate, and welcome to another episode, perhaps maybe unexpected, and a little bit of a Halloween treat, since today is Halloween 2023. Now, in the last episode, I did say these were going to come out every two weeks, but I figured, what the heck, it's Halloween, and it's been a while. So I thought, let's release three episodes in one evening. Whether that's a trick or a treat will be up to you to decide. Without further ado, here's How to Kill a Piano. Chapter 23. Halloween's Past. Sharon sat in the middle of the calm waters as they gently rocked the sides of the ferry boat at the in-between. Like a mother rocking a cradle to soothe an infant, the waters calmed Sharon. Sharon was unsure what to do with themselves on this Halloween evening. They always kept so busy, they rarely had time for anything, let alone anyone else. Cordiva was often the only contact they had with anyone that wasn't already dead. They carefully touched their left paw to their forehead, and with closed eyes, began to speak out into the darkness. What should I do with myself tonight? Sharon pondered. Cordiva's voice began to speak back from the moments ago empty fairy, though it was too dark now to be sure. We really need to stop meeting like this, Cordiva purred first licking her paw and then running the saliva up over her head, across her ears, dragging it through her fur. She continued to groom herself as she materialized, sitting calmly in the center of the ferry, otherwise ignoring Sharon's physical existence. I don't mean to bother, but it's Halloween and there isn't much to do. With the dead not needing my services, I don't know what to do with myself, Sharon barked. I thought maybe you and I could. We could do what? Cordiva responded, cutting Sharon off with annoyance. Spend some time together? Sharon dared not make eye contact at the request. You assume that I get the day off. I'm spending my time between different realms. And while I might not be bringing you clients to Shepherd, I have enough on my plate as it is. One of the Athenians has been sick. His mind is going, Gordiva hissed. The Athenians? I don't know much about them. Why haven't I had the privilege of any Athenians on my ferry? Sharon questioned, confused. They don't exactly transition the way the others do, Gordiva explained. Immortal, then, Sharon said matter-of-factly. Not exactly. When their vessels reach the end of their time, they pass themselves into a new form. Sharon listened attentively. Their curiosity peaked. This was a world they had only glimpsed but never truly understood. Cordiva's tasks were vast and complex, far beyond the scope of their own role. You speak of fascinating things, Cordiva, Sharon mused, their gaze finally meeting the glowing azure eyes of the feline form in front of them. I sometimes forget how vast and intricate the realms beyond can be. It's not just the dead souls I ferry across. There are entire worlds, immortal beings, and mysteries that I never encounter. Cordiva momentarily ceased her grooming and regarded Sharon with a mix of condescension and something resembling sympathy. Of course you do, dear Sharon. Your work may be singular, but it's essential. 
You guide souls to their final destinations, providing a service that brings closure and peace. Sharon's inquisitiveness wasn't satisfied. But what is this connection with the Athenians? How do they pass into new forms? Gordiva extended her clawed paw lazily swatting a spectral fish that had ventured too close to the boat. Athenians believe in the cycle of existence. When they sense their bodies have reached the end of their journey, they willingly let it go, allowing their consciousness to merge into a new form that they themselves grew into being. In doing so, they gain new perspectives, new experiences, and a new life in kind. Sharon nodded, taking in this newfound knowledge. So they become one with the cosmos and are reborn in a different form? That's beautiful. Cordiva's expression softened, her eyes betraying a touch of nostalgia. Yes, it is. And on this Halloween night, as the boundaries between the living and the dead blur, it's a reminder of the interconnectedness of all things. It's a night of transitions, not just for those that come to your ferry, but for the entire universe. Sharon gazed at the dark waters pondering the mysteries of existence and the unexpected wisdom they had gleaned from Cordiva. Thank you for sharing this with me, Cordiva. I may not fully grasp the scope of your work, but I appreciate your presence and your willingness to bridge the gap between our duties. Cordiva resumed her grooming, her voice gentler as she purred. You're welcome, Sharon. We may have different roles, but we share a purpose in guiding souls on their journey. In that, we are bound together like the threads of existence that weave through the universe. As the night unfolded and the in-between fairies sailed on the calm, dark waters, Cordiva received a message from the Athenian world. The message came from Scrutius. It was about Charlie, the Athenian who had been contemplating the cycle of existence and the traditions of his people. Scrutius reported that Charlie made a momentous decision. He no longer wished to imprint his memories upon another vessel and prolong his existence. Instead, he had chosen to allow his current form to come to an end. With his consciousness dissipating into the vast expanse of the universe, Cordiva, with a sense of urgency, called Sharon in closer to her side. Sharon, the time has come for you to fulfill your duty, she said, her voice solemn. There's an Athenian that has made a choice, and it's your responsibility to guide him onto your ferry. Take this night to walk alongside the dead and demons with delight. Go experience their world and fetch Charlie Seferic and ferry him across, and I will take care of being sure that Charlie fulfills his Athenian duties. Sharon nodded as Cordiva's form vanished from the ferry, leaving Sharon alone once again. The waters gently tapped the sides of the boat as it began to move through the waters, as Sharon moved it along, sculling the water with the rowing oar. 
while Sharon intended to obey their instructions, they couldn't ignore the gnawing unease deep within. Sharon soon found themselves venturing through the moonlit streets of the Athenian realm. Their paws led them to a quaint part of town where the soft strains of music floated into Halloween's night air. The street, lit by the flickering candles that breathed out like fire from the mouths of jack-o'-lanterns that lined the path. The glowing gourds soon guided them to an enchanting melody that flowed from inside one of the dwellings. Sharon found themselves sitting out front of the only one not decorated for Halloween. One window glowed out into the darkness, and inside you could see a woman sitting gracefully at a piano, with a man sitting silently on the couch next to her. As her fingers glided across the keys with ethereal skill, this was the first moment that Sharon laid eyes on Sarah, the goddess of music herself, in her earthly-like form as a piano teacher. Sharon was so captivated by the enchanting melody that they almost didn't notice Charlie sitting beside her. But as the melody progressed, Sharon slowly began to notice Charlie, and then the tears running down both of their faces. Sarah spoke softly to Charlie as she played. Sharon turned their ears towards the window, adjusting them to amplify their conversation as they continued to eavesdrop. Any regrets? Sarah asked. That I didn't make this decision sooner, and that I likely won't be there when it comes to be your time. Charlie responded. You'll always be with me, Charlie. Do you have any last requests before we start? I'm happy you're here with me, Charlie reassured. Sarah began to sob, saying goodbye is so hard. Goodbyes don't have to be sad, Charlie comforted, wrapping his arms around Sarah. Almost every goodbye means that we simply get to look forward to saying hello again. Charlie, you know you can't remember any of this. I might not remember, but we'll be saying hello for the first time all over again. But it won't be the first time, Charlie. We've said hello countless times. Eventually it'll be our last and neither of us will know it. Charlie choked back his own tears. I hope in this new life I can repay your kindness, Sarah. You already have, Charlie. Just by being yourself. Well then. Charlie wiped his face. We'll simply have to live each day like it's our last from now on. They shared a quiet, heartfelt moment, understanding that this was not a farewell, but a new beginning for both of them. Sarah's fingers paused briefly on the keys. Don't make me play the last few chords. You'll forget all about us. Charlie suddenly became wistful. You know I have to. Or my mind will continue to erode. Take care, Sarah. I love you. I hope your life is filled with love, happiness, and music. Tears streamed down both Charlie and Sarah's face. And you, Charlie. May your days be filled with wonder and discovery. As the music resumed and the chords continued to weave their magic, they resonated with the very essence of Charlie's existence, unlocking a deep and sacred connection. It was a connection that went beyond the physical realm. It was a connection that reached into the core of his being. It was a connection 
where his memories, experiences, and identity were entwined, revealing his very unique time signature. Look out for George for me. Will you? Charlie begged. Charlie, you'll be raising him yourself. You'll still be here in some way. I don't want to go, Sarah. I wish I could stay with you forever, but the cost of that forever is too great. Scrutius may think he found a way to cheat this process, but at what cost? I'm losing it. I'd rather take all of this away and start with a blank slate one last time before it's taken from me and I'm forced to imprint myself into a new form. George doesn't deserve that. No one deserves that. We didn't deserve that. Charlie's eyes, once clouded with uncertainty and fear, began to clear. The musical notes emanating from the piano seemed to pull at his very essence, gently releasing the tendrils of his Athenian memories that had been slowly unraveling his mind. With each chord, he felt a sense of liberation, as if the weight of countless lifetimes was slowly being lifted from his shoulders. The room began to pulsate with a soft glow, and Sarah continued to play. Her fingers danced gracefully across the keys. The magical chords were not just melodies. They were a bridge between realms, a conduit to the vast cosmic web of existence. As Charlie's consciousness started to disperse, he saw fleeting glimpses of his past lives, the wisdom and knowledge he had accumulated over centuries fading away like whispers in the wind. Sharon watched with curiosity. In the final moments, as Charlie's presence grew increasingly translucent, he turned to Sarah, who had become his anchor in this profound transition. And with a smile filled with gratitude, he whispered, Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for showing me this path. Sarah closed her eyes, her hands resting on the piano keys, and the enchanting music ceased. The room fell into a gentle, contemplative silence. It was a bittersweet moment a profound farewell to an Athenian who had chosen to defy tradition and to embrace morality for one last meaningful experience. The room was filled with a serene ambience. The gentle resonance of the piano's final notes still hung in the air. Charlie, now a mere mortal, looked into Sarah's eyes filled with a mixture of emotions that he didn't understand. They exchanged that one last lingering look. An echo of the profound connection between the two that had crossed paths in a world where boundaries dissolved. Sarah's fingers trembled. And Charlie suddenly had no idea where or who he was. Excuse me, I don't mean to trouble you, but I don't seem to know where I am. Oh, Charlie, Sarah gasped. Yes, I'm Charlie. And you are? Sharon watched from just outside the window in the darkness, realizing that the time to take Charlie had passed. Charlie had taken himself, and now Charlie was neither mortal nor immortal. Charlie was simply Charlie, a being in charge of themselves outside the realm of a storyteller's pen. Sharon felt moved by Charlie and Sarah. They didn't want to take Charlie, and now they couldn't. But Sharon didn't know what to do. So they ran up to the door of Sarah's music studio and barked, 
Trick or treat. It was Halloween, after all. Sarah, startled by the unexpected visitor, jolted at the sudden new sound. Her hands thrust down nonsensically on the keys in front of her, followed by three chords that froze the room in time. She gently kissed Charlie's forehead and whispered, Charlie, wait right here. You're safe here. We'll be done soon. I love you. Sarah walked to the door, peeked through the window, and saw a stray dog sat panting and looking back at her. She opened the door and greeted the puppy. Hello there, little one, she whispered, her voice a gentle caress. Are you lost on the spooky night? Sharon let out a soft, almost understanding bark as if in response. In this moment, the two of them communicated far more than words ever could. Sensing the stray's profound presence, Sarah smiled warmly and invited Sharon in. She walked back to the music room where Charlie stood frozen, Sharon walking quietly behind. I want you to meet the love of my life. This is Charlie. Although he no longer knows who he is. And I suppose we won't be in love anymore. Look at me. I'm talking to a dog. You probably don't understand what I'm saying. Sharon barked in acknowledgement. Sarah gasped in astonishment that the stray dog seemed to understand her. Sharon barked back again and again. And then, with words that said, It's okay. I can protect both of you. Sarah's eyes widened as Sharon slowly morphed into human form. But instead of fear, she felt an inexplicable sense of ease and comfort. Something about them felt familiar, like a long-lost friend returning home. Sharon and Sarah embraced and held each other for what seemed like forever. You're not an ordinary dog, are you? She asked, her voice tinged with curiosity. Sharon broke the embrace and took a step back, offering a warm smile, their eyes glimmering with secrets untold. No, my dear Sarah. I'm Sharon, the loyal servant of death, but tonight I am but a humble observer, drawn to the magic of your music and the power of your love. Sarah nodded in understanding, sensing the gravity of his words. Are you here to take Charlie? No. No. I wouldn't dream of it. I wouldn't dream of taking Charlie from you. Then what brings you to my humble studio, Sharon? The ferryman's heart pounded within their chest torn between revealing the truth and maintaining the masquerade, but they found themselves unable to resist the pull of honesty with this enchanting goddess of music. I was drawn here by the magic of your music, Sarah, they confessed, their voice gentle and vulnerable. It resonates with something deep within me, a connection I can't explain. And on this night of all nights, when the boundaries between worlds blur, I felt compelled to seek you out. Sarah's eyes softened, touched by the sincerity of their words. She sensed the weight that they carried, the burdens of their role as death's servant. 
And yet, there was a longing in their gaze, a desire for something beyond their duty. Perhaps there's a reason I cross paths tonight, she mused. Her fingers began dancing across the keys of the piano in a soothing melody. Music has a way of transcending barriers, of bridging the gap. To be honest, Sarah, I was sent here to take Charlie before he transformed. I was sent here to punish him for diverting from the path of your people. But there's so much more to this story than I was told. I can't simply take blindly anymore. Please, allow me to help you. Allow me to help Charlie. Sarah Swathy, the goddess of music, stood before her piano, its rich mahogany wood gleaming under the soft glow of the moonlight through the window. Her heart ached with a bittersweet resolve as she gazed upon the instrument that held the power to shape destiny. The time had come to make a choice that would forever alter the course of both her and Charlie's life forever. Charlie had willingly embraced mortality, desiring a life of growth and change. But to achieve this, he had to sever the ties that bound him to his past, sacrificing his memories for the promise of a fresh start. Sarah understood this. She also yearned for a new beginning, yet the weight of their shared history weighed so heavily upon her in this moment. With trembling fingers, Sarah traced the intricate carvings on the piano's lid. The echoes of countless melodies reverberating through her touch. The piano was an heirloom passed through generations that held the power to shape reality, to shape the very essence of existence. All you have to do is play, Sharon encouraged. Keep playing. Don't stop. And we can get through this together. You don't have to do this alone. I can be here with you. And I can keep Charlie safe. Sarah took a deep breath, summoning her divine energy and began to play. The notes flowed from her fingertips, carrying within them the weight of a thousand emotions. The melody swelled and cascaded, filling the room with resonance. Each note held a fragment of their shared past, a memory that would soon fade away. Sarah's gaze never wavered from the piano keys as her playing intensified. The room seemed to come alive with the magic of the moment, a hushed anticipation hanging in the air. She mustered the strength to speak, her voice laced with both sorrow and determination. Charlie, my love, she said, her voice catching on the weight of her words. I made a choice, one that will set you free to live a life untethered to the past. This melody, this act, it's meant to grant you the gift of forgetfulness. Confusion flickered in Charlie's eyes as he remained frozen in time, his brow furrowing in the mixture of surprise and concern. His lips could barely muster the words, Forgetfulness? But why? What is the purpose of forgetfulness? Tears welled in Sarah's eyes as she continued to play. Our love, Charlie, will forever reside within the depths of my being. Though you may forget, my heart will always remember. This is my sacrifice, my gift to you. As the final notes of the melody resonated through the room, Sarah watched as Charlie's gaze softened, his expression shifting from confusion to acceptance. He closed his eyes, surrendering himself to the power 
of the enchanting tunes. The room fell into silence once again, save for the echo of the piano's final vibrations. Charlie opened his eyes, a newfound lightness in his gaze. The weight of his memories had been lifted and replaced by a blank canvas upon which he could paint his new life. Sarah took a step back, her heart aching but filled with hope. Go now, Charlie, she whispered. Go home to the child. He's waiting for you for the first time sleeping in his bed. Tell him tales of the world and set him free, like I've set you free now. Her voice was barely audible. Embrace the unknown, and may life unfold before you like a symphony of endless possibilities. Charlie slowly nodded, a smile playing upon his lips. He took Sarah's hands in his own, feeling the warmth of their connection, one last time. With a lingering glance, he turned and walked away, stepping out the front door and into the vast expanse of the unknown as Sharon watched in silence. Sarah's fingers rested on the keys of the magical piano. She couldn't bear to watch him walk out that last time. The music of their love would forever resonate within her soul as a reminder of the sacrifice she made for his happiness. Sharon had been prepared to guide Charlie to the afterlife, but found themselves strangely moved by these course of events. They felt an unexplainable connection to Sarah, who offered an alternative to the customary path that they were there to fulfill. Over time, as the days turned into weeks and months, Sharon found themselves spending more time in the realm of the Athenians. They helped care for Charlie, who now lived as a shadow of his former self, and looked after me, guiding me as a mentor and a father figure. Sharon worked as a guardian, although I didn't know that at the time. Sharon couldn't help but notice the enchanting beauty of Sarah, who had shown compassion and understanding to all eternal beings, and Sarah and Sharon slowly fell in love. As the lines between the worlds continued to blur, Sharon realized that they had fallen head over heels. They no longer felt bound by their eternal duty, but bound by a newfound purpose in protecting and caring for those who dared to challenge the traditions of existence. With each passing day, the in-between fairy became less relevant to Sharon, though they never skipped out on their duties. They did prefer to remain by Sarah's side, and vowed to be there until it was time for Sarah to make the same choice as Charlie. As the mysterious and ever-evolving story of existence continued to unfold, Sharon's role in it had transformed, guided by the power of love and a newfound appreciation for the beauty of the living world. Odd that it would take those who are immortal to open their eyes to those who aren't. With each passing Halloween, Sharon and Cordiva continued to gather on Sharon's ferry. Though as time progressed, they had less and less to speak about. As the waters rocked gently beneath them, Cordiva became more and more impatient that Charlie was never collected. This has been How to Kill a Piano. As always, you can reach us at howtokillapiano.com for updates and information about what's next. Come on by. Buy some merch. Or don't. Don't let me tell you what to do. 
Till next time, I'm George Tate.